Book 19. Now Great Odyssey still remained in the hall, pondering how, with the help of Athene, he would murder the suitors. Presently he spoke in winged words to Telemachos, Telemachos, we must have the weapons stored away inside the high chamber, and when the suitors miss them and ask you about them, answer and beguile them with soft words, saying, I stored them away out of the smoke, since they are no longer like what Odysseus left behind when he went to Troy land, but are made foul, with all the smoke of the fire upon them. Also, some divinity put into my head this even greater thought, that with the wine in you, you might stand up and fight, and wound each other, and spoil the feast and the courting, since iron all of itself works on a man and attracts him. So he spoke, and Telemachos obeyed his dear father, and summoned out Eurycleia his nurse, and said to her, Come, nurse, please detain the women inside the palace, while I put away my father's beautiful armour in the inner room, it is carelessly laid in the house, and darkened with smoke, in my father's absence, and I was a child all that time. Now I would put it away, where smoke from the fire will not reach it. Then in turn Eurycleia his dear nurse said to him, I only hope, my child, that you will assume such foresight in taking care of the house and protecting all our possessions. But tell me, who is it will go with you and hold the light for you? The maids would have given you light, but you would not let them come out. Then the thoughtful Telemacho said to her in answer, This stranger will. I will not suffer a man who feeds from our stores, and does not work, even though he comes from far off. So he spoke, and she had no winged words for an answer. Eurycleia barred the doors of the strong-built great hall. The two men, Odysseus and his glorious son, sprang up and began carrying helmets, shields massive in the middle, and pointed spears, and before them Pallas Athene, holding a golden lamp, gave them splendid illumination. Suddenly Telemacho spoke a word to his father, Father, here is a great wonder that my eyes look on. Always it seems that the chamber walls, the handsome bases and roof timbers of fir and tall columns sustaining them, shine in my eyes as if a fire were blazing. There must be surely a god here, one of those who hold the high heaven. Then resourceful Odysseus spoke in turn and answered him, Hush, and keep it in your own mind, and do not ask questions. For this is the very way of the gods, who hold Olympos. You should now go to bed, and I shall remain behind here, so that I can continue to stir up the maids, and also your mother, and she in her sorrow will question me about everything. So he spoke, and Telemachos went out of the great hall to his own chamber to go to bed, with torches to light him to his bed, where he always lay when sweet sleep came on him. There he lay this time also and waited for the divine dawn, while great Odyssea still remained in the hall, pondering how, with the help of Athene, he would murder the suitors. But now circumspect Penelope came down from her chamber, looking like Artemis or like golden Aphrodite. They set a chair for her to sit on close by the fireplace. The chair was inlaid with ivory and silver, the craftsman Icmalios had made it, and for the feet he had joined on a footstool, all of one piece with it, a great fleece was spread out over the chair, and upon it circumspect Penelope took her place. Her white-armed handmaidens came from the palace. They cleared and carried away a great deal of food, with the tables and goblets, where the men in high spirits had been drinking, and shook the ash from the cressets onto the ground, then piled them again with pieces of wood, to give them light, and to warm them. Again for the second time Melantho scolded Odysseus, Stranger, do you mean to stay here all night and bother us by poking all over the house and spying upon the women? Take yourself out of the door, you wretch, and be well satisfied with your feast, or you may be forced to get out, with a torch thrown at you. Then looking darkly at her resourceful Odysseus said to her, I wonder, why do you hold such an angry grudge against me? Is it because I am dirty, and wear foul clothing upon me, and go about as a public beggar? The need is on me, for such is the lot of vagabonds and men who are homeless. I too was one who lived in my own house among people, prospering in wealth, and often I gave to a wanderer according to what he was and wanted when he came to me, and I had serving men by thousands, and many another good thing, by which men live well and are called prosperous, only Zeus, son of Kronos, spoiled it all, somehow he wished to. So, woman, you should now beware lest you lose all of that glorious look with which you shine among the handmaidens. Beware of your mistress, who may grow angry with you and hate you. Or Odysseus may come back. There is still time for hope there. And even if he has perished and will no longer come back, here is Telemachos, his son, by grace of Apollo grown such a man, and in his palace none of the women will be sinful and escape, since he is a child no longer. 
So he spoke, and circumspect Penelope heard him, and spoke to her maidservant by name and gave her a scolding, always I know well what monstrous thing you are doing, you bold and shameless bitch, you will wipe it off on your own head. You understood all this very well, because you had heard it from me, how in my halls I intended to question the stranger about my husband, since I am troubled for him incessantly. So she spoke and addressed her housekeeper, Urinome, Urinome, bring up a chair and put a fleece on it, so that the stranger can be seated, and tell me his story, and listen also to what I say. I wish to question him. So she spoke, and the servant quickly brought up and set down a well-polished chair, and laid a fleece across to cover it. On this, much enduring great Odysseus was seated, and their discourse was begun by circumspect Penelope, stranger, I myself first have a question to ask you. What man are you and whence? Where is your city? Your parents? Then resourceful Odysseus spoke in turn and answered her, Lady, no mortal man on the endless earth could have cause to find fault with you, your fame goes up into the wide heaven, as of some king who, as a blameless man and God-fearing, and ruling as lord over many powerful people, upholds the way of good government, and the black earth yields him barley and wheat, his trees are heavy with fruit, his sheep flocks continue to bear young, the sea gives him fish, because of his good leadership, and his people prosper under him. Question me now here in your house about all other matters, but do not ask who I am, the name of my country, for fear you may increase in my heart its burden of sorrow as I think back, I am very full of grief, and I should not sit in the house of somebody else with my lamentation and wailing. It is not good to go on mourning forever. Some one of your maids, or you yourself, might find fault with me and say I swam in tears because my brain drowned in liquor. Circumspect Penelope said to him in answer, Stranger, all of my excellence, my beauty and figure, were ruined by the immortals at that time when the Argives took ship for Ilion, and with them went my husband, Odysseus. If he were to come back to me and take care of my life, then my reputation would be more great and splendid. As it is now, I grieve, such evils the god has let loose upon me. For all the greatest men who have the power in the islands, in Dulition and Same and in wooded Zakynthos, and all who in rocky Ithaca are holders of lordships, all these are my suitors against my will, and they wear my house out. Therefore, I pay no attention to strangers, nor to suppliants, nor yet to heralds, who are in the public service, but always I waste away at the inward heart, longing for Odysseus. These men try to hasten the marriage. I weave my own whiles. First the divinity put the idea of the web in my mind, to set up a great loom in my palace, and set to weaving a web of threads, long and fine. Then I said to them, young men, my suitors now that the great Odysseus has perished, wait, though you are eager to marry me, until I finish this web, so that my weaving will not be useless and wasted. This is a shroud for the hero Laertes, for when the destructive doom of death which lays men low shall take him, lest any Achaean woman in this neighbourhood hold it against me that a man of many conquests lies with no sheet to wind him. So I spoke, and the proud heart in them was persuaded. Thereafter in the daytime I would weave at my great loom, but in the night I would have torches set by, and undo it. So for three years I was secret in my designs, convincing the Achaeans, but when the fourth year came with the seasons returning, and the months faded, and many days had been brought to completion, then at last through my maidservants, those careless husses, they learned, and came upon me and caught me, and gave me a scolding. So, against my will and by force, I had to finish it. Now I cannot escape from this marriage, I can no longer think of another plan, my parents are urgent with me to marry, my son is vexed as they eat away our livelihood, he sees it all, he is a grown man now, most able to care for the house, and it is to him Zeus grants this honour. But even so, tell me who you are, and the place where you come from. You were not born from any fabulous oak, or a boulder. Then resourceful Odysseus spoke in turn and answered her, O respected wife of Odysseus, son of Laertes, you will not stop asking me about my origin? Then I will tell you, but you will give me over to sorrows even more than I have, but such is the way of it, when one strays away from his own country as long as I have, wandering many cities of men and suffering hardships. Even so, I will tell you what you ask me and seek for. There is a land called Crete in the middle of the wine-blue water, a handsome country and fertile, sea-girt, and there are many peoples in it, innumerable, there are ninety cities. Language with language mix there together. There are Achaeans, there are great-hearted Etiocretans, there are Cydonians, and Dorians in three divisions, and noble Pelasgians, and there is Knossos, the great city, the place where Minos was king for nine-year periods, and conversed with great Zeus. 
He was the father of my father, great-hearted Deucalion. Deucalion had two sons, myself and the lord Idomeneus, but Idomeneus had gone with the curved ships to Ilion along with the sons of Atreus. My glorious name was Aethun, and I was the younger born, but he was the elder and better. It was there that I knew Odysseus and entertained him, for the force of the wind had caught him, as he was making for Ilion, and brought him to Crete, driving him off course past Meliae. He stopped at Amnisos, where there is a cave of Ilithia, in difficult harbours, and barely he had escaped from the storm wind. He went up to the town at once, and asked for Idomeneus, for he said he was his hereditary friend, and respected, but it was now the tenth or eleventh day since Idomeneus had gone away along with his curved ships for Ilion. But I took him back to my own house, and well entertained him with proper hospitality, since there was abundance in the house, and for his other companions, who were his followers, I collected from the public and gave them barley, and shining wine, and cattle to dedicate, to content their spirits. There the noble Achaeans stayed twelve days, for a mighty north wind contained them, such that a man could not stand upright and walk the earth. Some harsh divinity must have roused it. But on the thirteenth day the wind fell, and they put forth. He knew how to say many false things that were like true sayings. As she listened her tears ran and her body was melted, as the snow melts along the high places of the mountains when the west wind has piled it there, but the south wind melts it, and as it melts the rivers run full flood. It was even so that her beautiful cheeks were streaming tears, as Penelope wept for her man, who was sitting there by her side. But Odysseus in his heart had pity for his wife as she mourned him, but his eyes stayed, as if they were made of horn or iron, steady under his lids. He hid his tears and deceived her. But when she had taken her pleasure of tearful lamentation, then she answered him once again and spoke and addressed him, Now, my friend, I think I will give you a test, to see if it is true that there, and with his godlike companions, you entertained my husband, as you say you did, in your palace. Tell me what sort of clothing he wore on his body, and what sort of man he was himself, and his companions, who followed him. Then resourceful Odysseus spoke in turn and answered her, Lady, it is difficult to tell you, with so much time between, for now it is the twentieth year since he was in that place and went away from my country. Still, I will tell you, in the way my heart imagines him. Great Odysseus was wearing a woolen mantle of purple, with two folds, but the pin to it was golden and fashioned with double sheaths, and the front part of it was artfully done, a hound held in his forepaws a dappled fawn, preying on it as it struggled, and all admired it, how, though they were golden, it preyed on the fawn and strangled it and the fawn struggled with his feet as he tried to escape him. I noticed also the shining tunic that he was wearing on his body. It was like the dried-out skin of an onion, so sheer it was and soft, and shining bright as the sun shines. Many of the women were looking at it in admiration. But put away in your heart this other thing that I tell you. I do not know if this clothing Odysseus wore had come from his home, or if some companion gave it to him as he boarded his fast ship, or some friend abroad, since Odysseus had friendship with many men. Indeed, there were few Achaeans like him. I myself gave him a brazen sword and a double cloak of purple, a handsome thing, and a fringed tunic, and saw him off in the proper way on his strong bench vessel. Also there was a herald, a little older than he was, who went with him. I will describe to you what he looked like. He was round in the shoulders, black-complexioned, woolly-haired, and had the name Eurobates. Odysseus prized him above his other companions, for their thoughts were in harmony. He spoke, and still more aroused in her the passion for weeping, as she recognized the certain proofs Odysseus had given. But when she had taken her pleasure of tearful lamentation, then once again she spoke to him and gave him an answer, Stranger, while before this you had my pity, you now shall be my friend and be respected here in my palace. For I myself gave him this clothing, as you describe it. I folded it in my chamber, and I too attached the shining pin, to be his adornment, but I shall never welcome him home, come back again to the beloved land of his fathers. It was on a bad day for him that Odysseus boarded his hollow ship for that evil, not to be mentioned Ilion. Then resourceful Odysseus spoke in turn and answered her, O respected wife of Odysseus, son of Laertes, no longer waste your beautiful skin nor eat your heart out in lamentation for your husband. Yet I do not blame you. For any woman mourns when she loses her wedded husband, with whom she has lain in love and borne children, even a lesser man than Odysseus. They say that he was like the immortals. But now give over your lamentation, and mark what I tell you, for I say to you without deception, without concealment, that I have heard of the present homecoming of Odysseus. 
he is near, in the rich land of the men of Thesprosia, and alive, and bringing many treasures back to his household. He collects this about the district. His eager companions were lost to him, with his hollow ship, on the wine-blue water as he left the island of Thrinarchia, for Zeus and Aelios hated him, since his companions killed the cattle of Aelios. So they all perished in the wash of the great sea, only Odysseus, riding the keel, was cast ashore by the sea swell on the land of the Phaeacians, who are near the immortals, and they honoured him in their hearts as if he had been a divinity, and gave him much, and they themselves were willing to carry him home without harm. So Odysseus would have been home a long time before this, but in his mind he thought it more profitable to go about and visit much country, collecting possessions. For Odysseus knew profitable ways beyond all other men who are mortal, no other man could rival him at it. So Phidon, king of the Thesprotians, told me the story, and he swore to me in my presence, as he poured out a libation in his house, that the ship was drawn down to the sea, and the crew were ready to carry Odysseus back again to his own dear country, but before that he sent me off, for a ship of the Thesprotian men happened then to be sailing for Dulition, rich in wheat fields. And he showed me all the possessions gathered in by Odysseus, these would feed a succession of heirs to the tenth generation, so many treasures are stored for him in the house of the great king. But he said Odysseus had gone to Dodona, to listen to the will of Zeus, out of the holy deep-leaved oak tree, for how he could come back to the rich countryside of Ithaca, in secret or openly, having been by now long absent. So he is safe, as you see, and is now coming back. He is very close at hand, and will not for long be far from his country and his own people. I will swear you a firm oath to this. Zeus be my witness, first of the gods, and the table of friendship, and the hearth of blameless Odysseus, to which I come as a suppliant, all these things are being accomplished in the way I tell them. Sometime within this very year Odysseus will be here, either at the waning of the moon or at its onset. Circumspect Penelope said to him in answer, if only this word, stranger and guest, were brought to fulfilment, soon you would be aware of my love and many gifts given by me, so any man who met you would call you blessed. But here is the way I think in my mind, and the way it will happen. Odysseus will never come home again, nor will you be given conveyance, for there are none to give orders left in the household such as Odysseus was among men, if he ever existed, for receiving respected strangers and sending them off on their journeys. But come, handmaidens, give him a wash and spread a couch for him here, with bedding and coverlets and with shining blankets, so that he can keep warm as he waits for dawn of the golden throne, and early tomorrow you shall give him a bath, anoint him, so that he can sit in the hall beside Telemachos and expect to dine there, and it will be the worse for any of those men who inflicts heart-wasting annoyance on him. He will accomplish nothing here for all his terrible spite, for how, my friend? Will you learn if I in any way surpass the rest of women, in mind and thoughtful good sense, if you must attend, badly dressed and unwashed, the feasting in the palace? Human beings live for only a short time, and when a man is harsh himself, and his mind knows harsh thoughts, all men pray that sufferings will befall him hereafter while he lives, and when he is dead all men make fun of him. But when a man is blameless himself, and his thoughts are blameless, the friends he has entertained carry his fame widely to all mankind, and many are they who call him excellent. Then resourceful Odysseus spoke in turn and answered her, O respected wife of Odysseus, son of Laertes, coverlets and shining rugs have been hateful to me ever since that time when I left the snowy mountains of Crete behind me, and went away on my long-oared vessel. I will lie now as I have lain before through the sleepless nights, for many have been the nights when on an unpleasant couch I lay and awaited the throne dawn in her splendour. Nor is there any desire in my heart for foot basins, to wash my feet, nor shall any woman lay hold of my feet, not one of those such as do your work for you in your palace, not unless there is some aged and virtuous woman whose heart has had to endure as many troubles as mine has. If such a one were to touch my feet, I should not be angry. Then in turn circumspect Penelope answered, Dear friend, never before has there been any man so thoughtful, among those friends from far places who have come to my palace as guests, so thoughtful and so well considered is everything you say. I do have one old woman, whose thoughts are prudent, who was nurse to that unhappy man, and took good care of him. She took him up in her hands when first his mother had borne him, and she shall wash your feet, though she has little strength for it. Come then, circumspect Eurycleia, rise up and wash the feet of one who is the same age as your master. Odysseus must by this time have just such hands and feet as you do, for in misfortune mortal men grow old more suddenly. So he spoke, and the old woman covered her face in her hands, and shed hot tears, and spoke to him in words of compassion, how helpless I am to help you, my child. 
Surely Zeus hated you beyond all other men, though you had a godly spirit, for no man among mortals ever has burned so many thigh pieces to Zeus who delights in the thunder, nor given so many choice and grand sacrifices, as you prayed you might come to a sleek old age, and raise your glorious son to manhood. Now for you alone he took away your day of homecoming. So it must be for him also that in the houses of far-off friends, whose famous homes he enters, the women tease him, as now these sluts are all teasing you, stranger, and it is to avoid their abuse and shameful speaking you will not let them wash your feet. But circumspect Penelope, daughter of Icarios told me to do it, nor am I unwilling. So I shall wash your feet, both for the sake of Penelope but also for yourself, since the heart is stirred within me by sorrows, but come, attend to me and the word I tell you. There have been many hard-travelling strangers who have come here, but I say I have never seen one as like as you are to Odysseus, both as to your feet, and voice and appearance. Then resourceful Odysseus spoke in turn and answered her, so all say, old dame, who with their eyes have looked on the two of us. They say we two are very similar each to each, as you yourself have noticed and tell me. So he spoke, and the old woman took up the shining basin she used for foot washing, and poured in a great deal of water, the cold first, and then she added the hot to it. Now Odysseus was sitting close to the fire, but suddenly turned to the dark side, for presently he thought in his heart that, as she handled him, she might be aware of his scar, and all his story might come out. She came up close and washed her lord, and at once she recognized that scar, which once the boar with his white tusk had inflicted on him, when he went to Parnassos, to Autolycos, and his children. This was his mother's noble father, who surpassed all men in thievery and the art of the oath, and the god Hermes himself had endowed him, for he had pleased him by burning the thigh bones of lambs and kids, and the god freely gave him his favor. Autolycos came once to the rich country of Ithaca, and found that a child there was newly born to his daughter, and, as he finished his evening meal, Eurycleia laid him upon his very knees, and spoke him a word and named him, Autolycos, now find yourself that name you will bestow on your own child's dear child, for you have prayed much to have him. Then Autolycos spoke to her and gave her an answer, my son-in-law and daughter, give him the name I tell you, since I have come to this place distasteful to many, women and men alike on the prospering earth, so let him be given the name Odysseus, that is distasteful. Then when he grows up, and comes to the great house of his mother's line, and Parnassos, where there are possessions that are called mine, I will give him freely of these to make him happy, and send him back to you. This was why Odysseus came, so that he would give him glorious presents. Autolycos and the sons of Autolycos greeted him with clasping of hands and words of endearment, and Amphithea, his mother's mother, embraced Odysseus, and kissed his head and kissed too his beautiful shining eyes. Autolycos gave his glorious sons the order to make ready the dinner, and they listened to his urging. Presently they brought in an ox, a male, five years old. They skinned the victim and put it in order, and butchered the carcass, and cut the meat expertly into small pieces, and spitted the morsels, and roasted all carefully, and shared out the portions. So, for the whole length of the day until the sun setting, they feasted, nor was any man's hunger denied a fair portion, but when the sun went down and the sacred darkness came over, then they went to their beds and took the blessing of slumber. But when the young dawn showed again with her rosy fingers, they went out on their way to the hunt, the dogs, and the people, these sons of Autolycos, and with them noble Odysseus went. They came to the steep mountain, mantled in forest, Parnassos, and soon they were up in the windy folds. At this time, the sun had just begun to strike on the plowlands, rising out of the quiet water and the deep stream of the ocean. The hunters came to a wooded valley, and on ahead of them ran the dogs, casting about for the tracks, and behind them the sons of Autolycos, and with them noble Odysseus went close behind the hounds, shaking his spear far shadowing. Now there, inside that thick of the bush, was the lair of a great boar. Neither could the force of wet-blown winds penetrate here, nor could the shining sun ever strike through with his rays, nor yet could the rain pass all the way through it, so close together it grew, with a fall of leaves drifted in dense profusion. The thudding made by the feet of men and dogs came to him as they closed on him in the hunt, and against them he from his wood lair bristled strongly his nape, and with fire from his eyes glaring stood up to face them close. The first of all was Odysseus, who swept in, holding high in his heavy hand the long spear, and furious to stab, but too quick for him the boar drove over the knee, and with his tusk gashed much of the flesh, tearing sidewise, and did not reach the bone of the man. Now Odysseus stabbed at him, and hit him in the right shoulder, and straight on threw him past the point of the shining spearhead. He screamed and dropped in the dust, and the life spirit flittered from him. 
the dear sons of Autolycos were busy to tend him, and understandingly they bound up the wound of stately godlike Odysseus, and singing incantations over it stayed the black blood, and soon came back to the house of their loving father. Then Autolycos and the sons of Autolycos, healing him well and giving him shining presents, sent him speedily back rejoicing to his own beloved country in Ithaca, and there his father and queenly mother were glad in his homecoming, and asked about all that had happened, and how he came by his wound, and he told well his story, how in the hunt the boar with his white tusk had wounded him as he went up to Parnassos with the sons of Autolycos. The old woman, holding him in the palms of her hands, recognized this scar as she handled it. She let his foot go, so that his leg, which was in the basin, fell free, and the bronze echoed. The basin tipped over on one side, and the water spilled out on the floor. Pain and joy seized her at once, and both eyes filled with tears, and the springing voice was held within her. She took the beard of Odysseus in her hands and spoke to him. Then, dear child, you are really Odysseus. I did not know you before, not until I had touched my lord all over. She spoke, and turned her eyes toward Penelope, wishing to indicate to her her beloved husband's presence, but Penelope was not able to look that way, or perceive him, since Athene turned aside her perception. Odysseus groped for her, and took her by the throat with his right hand, while with the other he pulled her closer to him, and said to her, Nurse, why are you trying to kill me? You yourself suckled me at your own breast, and now at last after suffering much, I have come, in the twentieth year, back to my own country. But now that you have learned who I am, and the god put it into your mind, hush, let nobody else in the palace know of it. For so I tell you straight out, and it will be a thing accomplished. If you do, and by my hands the god beats down the arrogant suitors, nurse of mine though you are, I will not spare you when I kill the rest of the serving maids in my palace. Then in turn circumspect Eurycleia said to him, My child, what sort of word escaped your teeth's barrier? You know what strength is steady in me, and it will not give way at all, but I shall hold as stubborn as stone or iron. And put away in your heart this other thing that I tell you. If by your hands the god beats down the arrogant suitors, then I will give you the list of those women who in your palace have been mutinous against you, and tell you which are innocent. Then resourceful Odyssea spoke in turn and answered her, Nurse, why should you tell me of them? There is no need to. I myself will properly study each and learn of each. Leave it to the gods and keep the story in silence. So he spoke, and the old woman went back through the hall, to fetch another basin, for all the water that had been there formerly was spilled. When she had washed him and anointed him with oil, Odysseus drew his chair closer to the fire, trying to keep warm, but hid the scar under his ragged clothing. Circumspect Penelope then began their talking, Friend, I will stay here and talk to you, just for a little. To be sure, it will soon be the time for sweet rest, for one delicious sleep takes hold of, although he may be sorrowful. The divinity gave me grief beyond measure. The day times I indulge in lamentation, mourning as I look to my own tasks and those of my maids in the palace. But after the night comes and sleep has taken all others, I lie on my bed, and the sharp anxiety swarming thick and fast on my beating heart torment my sorrowing self. As when Pandario's daughter, the greenwood nightingale, perching in the deep of the forest foliage sings out her lovely song, when springtime has just begun, she, varying the manifold strains of her voice, pours out the melody, mourning Italos, son of the Lord Zethos, her own beloved child, whom she once killed with the bronze when the madness was on her, so my mind is divided and starts one way, then another. Shall I stay here by my son and keep all in order, my property, my serving maids, and my great high-roofed house, keep faith with my husband's bed and regard the voice of the people, or go away at last with the best of all those Achaeans who caught me here in the palace, with endless gifts to win me? My son, while he was still a child and thoughtless, would not let me marry and leave the house of my husband, but now that he is grown a tall man and come to maturity's measure, he even prays me to go home out of the palace, fretting over the property, which the Achaean men are devouring. But come, listen to a dream of mine and interpret it for me. I have twenty geese here about the house, and they feed on grains of wheat from the water trough. I love to watch them. But a great eagle with crooked beak came down from the mountain, and broke the necks of them all and killed them. So the whole twenty lay dead about the house, but he soared high in the bright air. Then I began to weep, that was in my dream, and cried out aloud, and around me gathered the fair-haired Achaean women as I cried out sorrowing for my geese killed by the eagle. But he came back again and perched on the jut of the gabled roof. 
He now had a human voice and spoke aloud to me, Do not fear, O daughter of far-famed Icarios. This is no dream, but a blessing real as day. You will see it done. The geese are the suitors, and I, the eagle, have been a bird of portent, but now I am your own husband, come home, and I shall inflict shameless destruction on all the suitors. So he spoke, and then the honey-sweet sleep released me, and I looked about and saw the geese in my palace, feeding on their grains of wheat from the water trough, just as they had been. Then resourceful Odyssea spoke in turn and answered her, Lady, it is impossible to read this dream and avoid it by turning another way, since Odysseus himself has told you its meaning, how it will end. The suitor's doom is evident for one and all. Not one will avoid his death and destruction. Circumspect Penelope said to him in answer, My friend, dreams are things hard to interpret, hopeless to puzzle out, and people find that not all of them end in anything. There are two gates through which the insubstantial dreams issue. One pair of gates is made of horn, and one of ivory. Those of the dreams which issue through the gate of sawn ivory, these are deceptive dreams, their message is never accomplished. But those that come into the open through the gates of the polished horn accomplish the truth for any mortal who sees them. I do not think that this strange dream that I had came to me through this gate. My son and I would be glad if it did so. And put away in your heart this other thing that I tell you. This dawn will be a day of evil name, which will take me away from the house of Odysseus, for now I will set up a contest, those axes which, in his palace, he used to set up in order so that, twelve in all, they stood in a row, like timbers to hold a ship. He would stand far off, and send a shaft through them. Now I will set these up as a contest before my suitors, and the one who takes the bow in his hands, strings it with the greatest ease, and sends an arrow clean through all the twelve axes shall be the one I will go away with, forsaking this house where I was a bride, a lovely place and full of good living. I think that even in my dreams I shall never forget it. Then resourceful Odysseus spoke in turn and answered her, O respected wife of Odysseus, son of Laertes, do not put off this contest in your house any longer. Before these people can handle the well-wrought bow, and manage to hook the string and bend it, and send a shaft through the iron, Odysseus of the many designs will be back here with you. Circumspect Penelope said to him in answer, If, my friend, you were willing to sit by me in my palace and entertain me, no sleep would be drifted over my eyelids. But it is in no way possible for people forever to go without sleep, and the immortals have given to mortals each his own due share all over the grain-giving corn land. So I shall now go back again to my upper chamber, and lie on my bed, which is made a sorrowful thing now, always disordered with the tears I have wept, ever since Odysseus went away to that evil, not to be mentioned Ilion. There I must lie, but you can sleep here in the house, either bedding down on the floor, or they can make a bed for you. So she spoke, and went back up to her shining chamber, not alone, since others, her women, went to attend her. She went back to the upper story with her attendant women, and wept for Odysseus, her beloved husband, until grey-eyed Athene cast sweet slumber over her eyelids.